guys, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window. Hey, Brie. Hey, Mochi. So glad you guys could join us. Brie got first. That's wonderful. So happy y'all are here. <laughs> All right. Um, can y'all hear us? Is everything going good? Landon, Landon, say hi. Hi, I am coming to you from my parents' house. Uh, it's a little bit of a different background today. And there's chaos happening. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> If we get little interruptions today, we apologize, um, but uh, but we'll do our best. <laughs> well, either be a form of humans or cats, one of the two. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've got Oreo right here next to me, and I've got the baby cam pointed at him. If anybody wants that on screen, I'll be happy to turn on the baby cam, just do the little little redeem. Um, but today, today on Inner Stage Window, we're doing something, we're doing an, another little different thing, right? So while I get the game going, Landon, if you could kind of explain um, what yes. it is that we're doing today. So part of what we are changing up in our way that we're doing the show is that we're also going to start talking about fandom lore and the different fandoms that exist in our culture, society, and especially con like connected to the media that we have just deep dived. So a few weeks ago, we deep dived Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So today's fandom topic is about something that is crucial part of the Harry Potter series, which is the Hogwarts houses. So we're not so much gonna talk about the context of Harry Potter or like, or the books. We are gonna mention it a little bit and, and talk about that, but we're gonna also focus on the perceived fandom side of things. So the way that this has affected the world and the community beyond just the media sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is yep. what we're gonna be doing today, which is, one of my favorite things to talk about ever. So <laughs> <laughs> proud Ravenclaw here too, Brie. I mean, I'm repping the Ravenclaw, but um, oh no, Sims crashed. I'm so sorry, guys. Hang on just a second. We'll keep talking while I'm getting Sims um, back up. My bad. Um, oh, well, uh, it happens. It's an old game. It's part of it. Anyway, while have... Sims is loading again. <laughs> so yeah. Claws in my life. It's actually hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. I'm like, oh. A three, a three out of five of my best friends are all Ravenclaws and no Gryffindors. Notice that. Oh, there must be something so there. That's interesting. Notice I heard this intro song's really loud. There we go. Okay. Sorry. That bit's just really super loud. So I wanted to get past it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I do feel like uh, in my life, it's kind of the same. At least the Harry Potter fans that I know mostly identify with um with slytherin or with ravenclaw or they're not super involved in the fandom and the ones that are not super involved in the fandom of course identify with gryffindor because when you read the books that's the only viable option to identify with so that's interesting but that's what we're gonna talk about today ah! <laughs> uh but before we dive into all of that karen would you like to tell us about your favorite thing this week i would love to tell you about my favorite thing this week because my favorite thing this week is the Loki show. And I am, oh my God, I am shipping Lokius so hard. I have to tell you guys, Loki and Mobius. I also somebody saw somebody call it um, Wowkey for, uh, for the, <laughs> the ever popular wow <laughs> of, uh, of Owen Wilson. Um, I, I am so into this show, y'all. It's so good. So I've watched some of the other Marvel shows. Like I watched WandaVision. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have not watched uh, The Falcon and Winter Soldier. Uh, it just, the previews didn't really super appeal to me, is the truth, but I've heard it's decent. Uh, I'll yeah. eventually get a, go back and watch it, but Loki, I am loving. It's so good. It's been so good from go, you know, and something I really enjoy, I'm enjoying about it compared to WandaVision is WandaVision, after a couple of episodes, did like a whole 180 on what the show was really even about, you know, and, um, and I don't think a huge tone shift is going to happen in, uh, in Loki. I think it's kind of like what we've got now is what's is what we're gonna get um and I'm, I'm just i'm loving what we have now i love the concepts of the um of like the time uh timekeepers and all of the bureaucracy below that and i'm loving the relationship between the two main characters loki and mobius it's just it's really freaking good uh if you have not started it yet please start it it's it's amazing are all the episodes out no it's only two episodes okay. they release weekly so if you want to binge, you have to wait. To first, so yeah. <laughs> I'll wait until it's all out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to binge, it's not going to happen right now. Um, you have to wait. 
but I've heard I've heard really good things about it, and of course I've seen like TikTok go crazy over it. So that's TikTok. I've just de- decided is the new Tumblr in some ways. Uh-uh. So that's how I've decided that I'm like, oh, this is really big with my specific people. Good to know. Mm-hmm. It'll be a good show to watch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really good. I think you'll like it once you get around to it. But yeah, if you want to binge, it's going to be a little while before you can binge because they release episodes weekly. That's fine. I'll yeah. wait. I have Shadow and Bone to watch first. So. <gasps> true, true. First. So that's my favorite thing this week. Um, Landon, what's your favorite thing this week? Um, well, because if I'm at my parents' house, so I am technically on vacation. Um, school stopped. We had our last day of school. I was able to close down the classroom. And then I flew out to Colorado. And because of that, I have done so much reading. Um, in the last week, I have read four books, <laughs> um, which is so nice to get back to because I didn't consume fiction for so long because when you're in college all you're doing is reading and the last thing you want to do in your free time is read um, books destroy that don't they yeah it was it was I was like I really do love reading I just don't have the energy for it and it's because I was doing so much reading for classwork mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. so now that I am reading again it's so nice and I picked up a book that has been out for a little while but I think that everyone should should read it if they like um contemporary fiction and it's called the invisible life of Addie LaRue um and it's it is a it is a book about a woman who was born in the 1700s in France and accidentally sells her soul to the devil and the caveat is to live forever and the caveat is is that nobody can remember her uh, so if she leaves their eyesight, they forget everything about her. Um, oh. and, until one day she walks into a bookstore and there's a boy who remembers her. And it's dun, dun, dun. a really well-written, um, timeless piece. It has some really good twists. The chemistry between characters is great. The characters are well-developed. Uh, maybe I'll make Karen read this. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I think that if you are, if you are an avid reader, uh, it is a great book uh, to read. It so, sounds really cool. I love the premise is, already. It is really cool. And I think actually, I think it would be a wonderful like mini series, not a whole TV show mm. and not a movie. So maybe somewhere like a four episode arc. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A British miniseries, I think, would be a really <laughs> good uh, way because it's very cinematic when you're reading it. It's very cinematic. Oh, okay, okay. So, oh, I love that. That sounds so good. I mean, the premise is incredibly intriguing. It it is. It's like oh, that's and it's it. There isn't a lot of magic or anything like that. It's very much based in the world except for this one thing and i love books that can that can build that kind of magic in our in our world Uh uh-huh yeah yeah i love that kind of stuff too like um you know uh what what is it called it oh malcolm got a promotion he's a minor (laughs) leaguer level two yay hey fabulous good job good job honey (laughs) keep making them keep making that money Mm -hmm. but yeah I think um, that is, it is a really good book and it was my favorite book that I've read this week and actually a favorite book that I've read in quite a while. Would completely recommend it. Everybody should read it. Okay. I'm down. It sounds really good. Yes. So that's my favorite thing. Shall we get into the topic now? Yes. Yes. So I think um, if you guys were in our Harry Potter episode a couple of weeks ago, you saw we had... A moment that we were going to talk about the um <laughs> the houses but we like click 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 skipped real skipped past it because we were already on, over on time so um i would like us whoa oh my god lunar oh. lunar thank you lunar. so much for the biddies holy crap holy moly. that's a lot of bits that's a lot a lot of bits lunar i love you so much thank you <gasps> <laughs> holy moly Oh my God! Okay, that's one way to get that. It's that's one way to get that sticker, right? <laughs> oh, how how uh, that? Yeah, holy crap! Yep, yeah. Thank you so much. 
Oh um, my god, that's amazing. <laughs> did y'all like did y'all like how for the Harry Potter stream I changed it to like a little wand instead of the normal magic circle? Did y'all like that touch? I did that. Um and uh I'm I'm glad y'all were able to see it for any notifications that we get. All right. Um so what were we saying? Oh yeah. So we skipped real real quick past it. Click click click, right? So before we really get into it, I want us to go ahead and um, and talk about some of those things that we wanted to talk about in regards to the Hogwarts houses um, that we had, you know, that we had started, that we had mentioned. So that being said, uh, Landon, if, if you want to kick it off, whatever piece you want to talk about first for, for Hogwarts houses, go for yeah. it. Yeah, no, I definitely think that first, if you didn't see the media episode, I definitely recommend it. It was really well done. I'm very proud of it. So just shouting out to that go ahead and go watch that too um but as far as the houses go i think we should really talk about um probably start with the idea that there is this uh idea that separating these students gives a form of camaraderie and kinship uh and that we're supposed to treat all of these houses like equal and separate however they're separate but not equal mm -hmm. uh, the way the that narrative doesn't treat them equally yes. the narrative doesn't treat them equally and the characters within the narrative doesn't treat them equally either mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um we have we have characters who even beyond even though they're older than school age characters really like favor houses mm-hmm with no reason behind that because like it's like going back to your high school and being like oh my high school mascot was a wolf so wolves are awesome and now I'm going to be loyal to anyone who's a wolf ever <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. I mean I do still love cats and my high school and college mascots both were cougars but um I like cats before that so that's just a funny coincidence it's not because of that <laughs> it was, it, it was Katie just, welcome uh, hey um I love Hufflepuff for you, Katie. That makes me I so do happy. too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> had canon <laughs> accepted. No, I think uh, there is this like, there is this idea. It, it almost reminds me of the like the Greek system in colleges, where you have that mm. blind loyalty to your Greek sorority mm -hmm. or fraternity, where you're just mm -hmm. like no one in this house can do any wrong even after you've grown up out of college and you've stopped going to events. You're like, oh, you're a Beta Kappa Chi awesome you are great in my book you're a great but you know something that a lot of a lot of sororities <laughs> and fraternities yeah but you know something that a lot of sororities and fraternities do that really builds that camaraderie that has nothing to do with the the harry potter books though is they do a lot of charity work and things like that so that's oh, yeah. how that happens um so so by the way we're we're saying all of this um we recognize that uh the jk rowling was trying to riff off of the house system that she you know that that's that actually it takes place in a lot of uk schools and we know she was trying to critique it so like we know that the that the point was not to say houses are good so just just to make that clear we know but what we're talking about is not intent it's the reality of what is in the books yeah and it's it but even then it's like i don't know if it was i don't i didn't see enough proof in the writing to see that it was a riff off of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or if it was inspired by it and taken mm -hmm. to the next extreme. Like, I don't think it was a commentary. There was not enough in the novel that showed me it was a commentary on why this is corrupt, silly, stupid, whatever thing she was trying to comment on. Or if this was just, hey, this thing happens in UK, UK schools. So it makes sense that it would happen in Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. yeah you can't tell so you can't tell world. reading the books you can't tell yeah. reading the books um so she can say whatever she wants and we'll talk about that later as well but in the books there is no proof that this is a riffing off of anything um mm -hmm. <laughs> it is it is that you are separated as students and then you never come together with your other students like there is no in any of the books inner house unity happening nope. Or not inner house, the like the houses combining, like other than yeah. going to classes. But even then, the classes are given the examples we see of classes interacting, specifically, you know, Snape in with Snape in potions class, is that there is a competitiveness between Gryffindor and Slytherin, and it is dependent on the teachers 
who are all biased for their favorite mm -hmm. houses. There mm -hmm. isn't a single unbiased teacher. So all of a sudden it's like, okay, there is, there is no way for Hufflepuffs and Slytherins to be friends or for nope. Gryffindors and Ravenclaws to be friends or anything because there's no engaging. You're like in a separate sub school within the school. <laughs> Yep. There's literally only two examples in the whole books where you can argue that any of this happens. The first example being dating. If some, if a student thinks another student's hot that's in another house, they will date them, right? So there is, you know, inter-house dating, right? Um, but, uh, but the only other example is Luna Lovegood. And the only reason, like, that she acts how she acts and she bonds with the Gryffindors the way she bonds with the Gryffindors is because she feels ostracized by her own house. Like yeah. she expresses that people don't like her. And the only reason she bonds with the Gryffindors is because her and Harry have a, a, a nice first meeting. That's literally it. And, we'll and talk, we get no other examples. And I, and I just don't think that's enough. You know, it proves that the houses really are separate. Yeah. And I think we'll talk about Luna when we get to her because she's such an interesting character, like as a deep dive. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that the other important thing about Luna is that she is, again, these relationships that are being built are another form of trauma bonding. Yep. Uh, Golden Trio are trauma bonded, Neville is trauma bonded in there, and then Luna becomes trauma bonded. Like it, mm -hmm. is, it is, again, that abused girl joins the abused misfits. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, it is this interesting, it's the same character repeated, even though she's... Yep has different characteristics it's the same sort of the same trope yeah. it's the same trope yeah, is basically trope. what we're what we're saying like we know um, luna's not the same character but she's 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 a repeated trope exactly so i think that um katie you make a great point that everyone likes to belong and connect and that's something that we will talk about about why it became like a grass fire within the fandom these harry potter houses but in the context of the books it really doesn't make any sense yeah <laughs> um and it really is treated unfairly mm -hmm. uh and then you like especially when it comes to like defining the points of the houses so like the whole house system if we dissect it we go from that there is a magical sorting hat that has four established houses and your traits, depending on who you are, are going to put you in the house with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And you break it literally down looks houses. inside your head. It looks inside yeah. your head. So it's looking at your memories, your experiences, your values, all of those things that make up you. And, and well, we, looking at that and deciding how to sort you. But even then, we as the reader don't know that, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are examples where it's like, oh, it sat on Neville's head for a full minute. And then with Draco Malfoy, it barely even touched his head. So how mm -hmm. deep can it really go into those thoughts and memories and stuff like that? So we have actually no source of idea what the hat is discovering or looking at. We only know as a narrative, uh, reading the, the media, that it touches your head and knows exactly what values you find the most important mm -hmm. or that you connect to the most. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those values are brave, strong, and willing to fight, aka the good guys. Yep. Um, <laughs> smart, uh, smart, and books like book smart, not not street smarts, book smart, mm -hmm. creative. Although that isn't highlighted for several novels. Yeah. Uh, and and witty is that the third? I think so. Plot? Yeah, um, kind which, of. Which, by the way, are all synonyms of each other, but that's fine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you have uh, cunning, ambitious, uh, and yeah, cunning and ambitious. And then you have everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like, it's literally how it's described. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like this weird split system where it's like, okay, children, you are being labeled, and then that is who you're going to be forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you really are. Because like, okay, so here's here's the thing. Here's the thing with these houses. Because when you get into a house, you interact almost solely with the students in that house. Whatever the values are of that house, whatever, whatever collectively um, those students are, that's how you're going to be whether you want to or not. Because that is your only peers that you're having deeper interactions with right like even though they have classes with other houses 
still like for example in potions they have like potions lab partners right they don't pick a lab partner in another house they could but they never do right they're always partnering with other kids inside their own house even though they've got classes with kids from other houses right like that just never happens even though when you as as a fandom we can make the logical conclusion that like oh well that that probably happens i'm sure that it happens but in the books the truth is it never does so we don't even we don't really know that it's yeah it's this really convol it's it's a system that makes sense to the point of a children's book, but it's not wealth. I mean, it's another gape in, in the hole as far as uh, that editors were obviously not expecting this to be as big as it was. Yep. Because no one would have sat there and been like, we probably shouldn't split children into four houses. <laughs> or at least if we're going to, like this is another thing, if we're going to do this, where's the commentary on it? Yes. And there is commentary on it in the later books. Like I don't want to, pretend like that doesn't exist but it's incredibly shallow which we'll we'll get into in in the next section about um what the commentary that does exist in the books actually means and is actually saying and the broader implications of it yeah and and i just it's incredibly shallow and then it also continuously contradicts itself yes i think mm -hmm. is an important thing to bring up too mm -hmm. but yes it, it gets much deeper we see how the house system affects the entirety of the wizarding world uh, for the rest of the novels when we have more insight into what's happening in the wizarding world. Mm -hmm. uh, but here at school, like, yeah. So you, you split these kids into four houses and then it is used as a competition of good behavior. Mm -hmm. Like the purpose of splitting these kids up is not just these are going to be your roommates, but it's also we are then going to expect you to behave in a way that's going to get you points. Yep. But the point system is never defined. There aren't clear cut rules, at least explained to the readers, about how to get points. Because seemingly, points are given and taken away depending on the professor's mood. Mm -hmm. uh, Snape hates Harry, so he literally just takes points away from Harry, Ron, and Hermione the entire novel. Right. And then at the uh, end... Dumbledore feels like what, you know, Harry, Ron, and Hermione did was very heroic, so Gryffindor gets a bunch of points, right? And even and I though, mean, that's, yeah, that's that the shouldn't point that have the happened. Is rigged. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's super unfair. It's super unfair to the other kids that, um, that something that, uh, that these, that these kids did suddenly makes Gryffindor win at the end, when it's like, you know, what about everything else that happened during the whole year? Like, why do you get, why does, like, doing something amazing at the very end mean that you get to win like that's that's pretty wrong that is by the way both illegal and against school rules yeah <laughs> Which is what Dumbledore says in his speech is that like yeah you broke the rules but here's a hundred points like yeah and it's like what <laughs> and then being like oh and then standing up to your friends is worth five points like mm -hmm. it, there is no clear-cut rule uh and then it's also this idea that like in the novel, it, it says that like Slytherin won the last seven years or something mm -hmm. like that for the House Cup. Like they haven't been beatable in seven years. And then all of a sudden they weren't going to be beaten that year because they were listening to the rules and quote unquote being the good kids because they mm -hmm. were following the rules that was hypothetically getting them points, even though they're, they're painted as the antagonists, which again, uh -huh makes no sense but then at the end in the last five minutes we lose the system that has been set in place to make up for a narrative win but that goes against the entire world that we have been told to try to trust yep um which is like just proves that the house system is broken <laughs> it's super broken it's super broken you know, it just, it doesn't make sense. It's the same thing that I was saying before um, when we were talking about the first book that I really believe um, that J.K. Rowling does not think of things in a systemic way or understand them in a systemic way. Um, she just thinks, she really does think that the world is good people and bad people and you have to beat the bad people. Like, I think she, she really thinks that. And I know a lot of children's media pushes that, but there's a difference between children's media pushing that because it's children's media and it's easier for kids to understand versus children's media pushing that 
where it's not like, uh, where it's obvious that the author knows it's not as simple as that. <laughs> you know, there's a difference, right? There's a difference. Yeah. There is, and Harry Potter a... definitely doesn't ever show anything that knows the adult who should know better that's writing these books understands this. <laughs> well, I, I think that this also did, I think this was another example of, I think that this shows the hand of children's literature in one way, but it also shows that J.K. Rowling isn't necessarily good at raising stakes because mm -hmm. the house points are supposed to add tension and raise stakes. This is the only book that house points matter. Yep. Uh, as And we haven't dissected it further yet. We haven't read the books yet, uh, yet further, but from my memory, house points, like even though the house trophy is an important part of every year and ending every year, the idea of like, Harry, Ron, and Hermione being so caught up on how many oh. points Gryffindor has. We have we have a chance matter. card. Yeah, we have a chance card. So let's pause real quick. Okay, yes. the assistant coach has asked Malcolm to help move an upright piano for one of the more senior players on the team. Malcolm is a bit worried about overstraining himself, but the move might also be a way to get in good with the manager and some of the players. He could agree or make up an excuse. So Landon, should he move the piano or make an excuse? You gotta decide quicker, it's gonna disappear. Oh, um, may, make up an excuse. Okay. Malcolm tells the assistant coach that he's been experiencing back spasms, that he's so focused on the upcoming game with the Red City Hammers that he needs to get some extra therapy and some extra practice sessions before the game. The coach agrees with his level-headedness and decides to hire professional movers to move the piano. Malcolm earns two logic skill points for his quick thinking. Woo! Good job. Smart husband. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Back to houses. Keep going. No. And I think, um, yeah, it, it's just this idea of that it stops being important. It's this thing that is in crucial to the narrative of this story. And then it has obvious gaps in the logic yeah. and it is never picked up again. Yep. Which is fine. It's a book series. It was children's literature. It didn't have good art authorship. But it is fascinating that it is this idea of this like camaraderie and point system. And that's the reason that the houses exist. And in the fandom, the most popular and most talked about thing is these the house system. Mm -hmm. Like even though it's not the discussion of the house system, people have on dating profiles, on, on Twitter bios, on Instagram, uh, tattoos, all of these things, what house is representative of, of them. Mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. highly talked about and considered, but it is a completely broken system that stops mattering after the first book. <laughs> yep, yep. And you know, and it's fine in the narrative that it stops mattering, but it's interesting that how little it matters in the book and how, how underdeveloped it is in the book compared to how developed it is in the fandom, right? Yeah. Like, it's insane. If you look at the Harry Potter fandom, you would think that the houses are this crucial part of the book, and they're really not. I mean, they're really just an easy way to to uh, to sort the characters so that it's easy for you to remember the ridiculous number of side characters that are in this book, right? That's really what it is. Uh, but uh, but you, you think, looking at the fandom, that that wasn't the case. Oh, Malcolm got promoted again, wonderful. He's doing Hell great. Yeah. He's doing so good. <laughs> A good husband. Um, I think that that brings us to talking about, and we've hinted about it a little bit, but talking about the biggest problem that comes with the Hogwarts houses. Mm -hmm. And that's the Slytherin problem. Yes. Um, so I think it's impossible to have this conversation without doing a deep dive into Slytherin and, and what Slytherin means. So, um, so we're going to talk about Slytherin a lot, and that's why you can see we're we're Slytherin colors today. Um, that's why we've got the, the Slytherin. All about us, a Slytherin. Yeah, well, <laughs> all about us. I mean, whatever. Anyways, so it's impossible to talk about the houses without talking about Slytherin. So, that this is the problem. In the books, Slytherin is the evil house. Like the Sorting Hat can say what it wants about am it how, being the house of ambitious wizards or whatever. In the narrative, there are no good Slytherins. They are literally all bigots and bullies. Find me an example of a Slytherin that's never been bigoted, that's never been a bully. You can't find one, I promise. It doesn't exist. 
Well, there is, there is one. Technically, this is the argument, right? Yeah. That Slughorn. He's not. He's not. He is. He does have a bigoted comment in the books. It's like at the does beginning he? of. Yeah. It's like in at the beginning of the book that he's in. I can't remember which one it is, but I'm pretty Half sure he has a. I'm pretty sure he has a bigoted comment. I don't. I don't think that he goes all the books without any comments at all. I thought he no, because I thought Harry thought he was making a bigoted comment, but then he explained that he wasn't because maybe and maybe that in itself is like inherently... yeah. See, there you go. You're, you're remembering the scene. <laughs> yeah, you're remembering the that. scene I'm talking about. Yeah. No, there was he. He made a comment about like she. Oh, and she was a Muggleborn, and Harry's like, oh God, and he's like, no, I mean like my favorites were Muggleborns. They're fantastic. Uh-huh. My favorites. I also have a black friend. I'm sorry, that's what it sounds like. You can say Slughorn wasn't a bigot, but he was. He just wasn't as, he wasn't completely overt in it, so maybe it's harder to see it. But he was. But he's also, like, and I'm not trying to argue that he is a good Slytherin, because at the same time, too, he's not portrayed well. He's portrayed Mm -hmm. as this mousy thing that's trying to find success through other people. Mm -hmm. He's a kingmaker, right? That's the character trope that he is. But it's the narrative of how it's explained is so incredibly like Harry just finds him disgusting because of that. Yeah. Um, that he's using other people's fame. And it's like, well, some people do that. <laughs> it doesn't make them inherently bad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but I, I no. mean, that is Harry's character trait though, is that he doesn't think very deeply about other people. That's, so he's not, yeah, he's Harry. Yeah. Um, so, so if we think about this, there is, there is one character that, that some fans will argue for, right? Slughorn. And he's, he's the only example, and he's not even, you know, that perfect. There is no just regular old nice guy Slytherin. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the books. Um, yeah. And, oh, and my gosh. Then... Thank you so much, Lunar, for, Lunar! Uh, for upgrading your subscription to Tier 2. Ah! <laughs> oh, you're the best. Okay. She's doing um, so much for us. <laughs> to, it's, it's too much. I'm getting overwhelmed. I can't talk. <gasps> okay. Let me compose. Okay. No, I okay. and also like, and not only that, it's that also we then learn to find out that characters that aren't even given houses in the media in the books mm-hmm. are then put in Slytherin because of their morality. Yeah, Dolores Umbridge being number one of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll we'll talk about this later too. Is how uh how the characters within Harry Potter are not developed enough for us to actually have sense of what houses they are. Fandom does that for us. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but because it's just like, so like a run wrench in the gut that the other evil character that is not ever given a house uh, is given a house post worth, even though there's no traits to necessarily back that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's, it's not even named. It's not even like, said in the media but all evil characters are in Slytherin yep yep pretty the much only the oh see and this is the hard one the only evil or bad prota- like antagonist that's not even an antagonist that isn't in Slytherin is uh Lockhart and to be completely honest, I would argue that he is the most likely to be in Slytherin. Yeah, like he's all about <laughs> ambition. That's his only character trait, and yet he's not in Slytherin. It's very strange. It's, I mean, there are yeah. other there are examples of, of evil characters that are in other houses, but again, like a good example of that is Peter Pettigrew. But like, it doesn't make any sense why he's in Gryffindor. It doesn't make any sense. He's literally just like, he's just like, he's the Neville of that generation. And therefore, he's in Gryffindor. But like, why? It he doesn't have doesn't any Gryffindor traits. But Neville is in Gryffindor either. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Well, no, that's not true. It does make sense if Neville is in Gryffindor, if it turns out that the sorting system has literally nothing to do with the actual person and has mm-hmm. to do with their wants and wishes, which we get a hint of with Harry. Yes. Um. Because then that explains why all seven Weasley children are in Gryffindor. Statistically, it makes zero fucking sense. Right. Especially because they're all supposed to be vastly different in personality. And they are. Um, like, um, like Fred and George are totally different than the rest of the Weasleys. And I would even argue make way more sense 
being either Slytherins or Hufflepuffs because their main their main Ooh. traits are being ambitious. Like they go open that that store at the end, yep. right? And and being jokesters and and welcoming to everybody, right? And uh, those are their main traits. That's a Slytherin trait and a Hufflepuff trait. I'm sorry. Or even, or even Slytherin, how creative they are. Or not Slytherin, I'm sorry. Ravenclaw, how creative they are, how much studying they sure. do have to do just because they're not the traditional book smart that we relate to Ravenclaw. I would argue that those characters, these traits that we are presented as, have every other trait but Gryffindor traits. They kind of do, <laughs> right? So, so like when we take when we take these elements of the book, so this is how fandom gets into the idea of like your house isn't necessarily your personality trait. Your house is really more about your values, right? Because when you actually look at what's happening in the books, it there it's just not it's not ever fully explained and it's not ever clear so you kind of can extrapolate from that that what the sorting hat is really doing is it's looking to see like what do you really want what do you what are your values what other kids are you going to get along with most like that's what it's really looking at you know and uh, and so i think that's why in fandom a lot of times what we will say is things like you know your house is what your values were when you were 11 years old because if you do a deep reading of the books and you really think about it, that's the only thing that makes any sense. And which also, by the way, is the value of your parents, because there are very few 11 year olds that I know that do not value the things that they weren't taught to value. Right, right. They don't have which is how you end up with all the bigots in Slytherin. <laughs> <laughs> and all the Weasleys in Gryffindor. Uh huh. Um, yeah, no, so it's just, it's this, it's a convoluted thing. But yes, Slytherin is full of bigots, a full of bad guys of bullies um yeah but they're oh my that, gosh like, what well, kayla kayla shadow hi welcome welcome raiders hi. thank you so much for raiding um kayla welcome to the stream do i know you tell me tell me who you are oh my gosh thank you so welcome. much thank yeah, you yeah we're you. talking about uh harry potter houses and their effect on fandom so now we're just kind of criticizing the way harry potter houses work because it's yeah and we're and we're kind of like um equal parts uh <laughs> dunking on and praising slytherin right at this moment so if you're a slytherin come join us that's what we're here for right this second um well yeah <laughs> so like another another good example of that is like okay there's no slytherins in dumbledore's army makes no sense if ambition is their main trait like why would there not be slytherins that would be ambitious about changing the system yeah why um, it makes no sense well, and then, like, there's also in the actual book, and I know you have a comment on this, not a single Slytherin fights against you-know-who. Yes. In okay. the book, not a single yes, Slytherin. Yes, I have a comment on this. Okay, so a bunch of fans will tell you, oh, Slughorn brought some Slytherins back to fight in the Battle of Hogwarts. But when you read the books, that literally doesn't happen. It's not in there. So it's like, why does everyone think this? Why does everyone who hasn't read the books since they were a kid think this? Well, the reason why is because J.K. Rowling was on a podcast, which Landon, if you could paste the link of the, the transcript from the podcast, because I went and found this before stream to prove it, because I think a lot of people are going to tell me I'm wrong. Um, but I'm not wrong. It's not in the books. I promise you. Go find it. The, she says it here. In the transcript from this podcast from linkycauldron.org, right? And and it's just, it's a comment that she makes. If you click that link, Landon, just put in the chat and you control F for the word fight, you will find it. But this, this scene that she describes, this moment she describes, doesn't happen. It's not in the books, okay? And so, like, this idea that there are some good Slytherins is literally a fandom creation. It's a, it's a fandom creation that we started, that J.K. Rowling thought about later or got from us i don't know i'm not in her brain i don't know where if she got it from us or if she realized later this was silly but like this was a fandom creation that jk rowling latched onto and decided was true it was never true in the books it didn't happen okay sure. it didn't happen so here's my question because this is going this kind of passion and topic is going to continue to come up throughout the entirety of this this stream and also series yeah. of J.K. Rowling editorializing canon and yep. coming back and saying things that there is no proof of in the book. 
um, I feel that we need to either take a shot or have a song. <laughs> during <laughs> <laughs> Lunar, what a what a beautiful use of the the sipping tea emoji that you just unlocked um i love that right now um this is like little little claps little claps for lunar little claps for lunar yeah i don't know we're gonna have to do something you know every time uh, rewatches people that watch the vods okay people that watch the vods drinking game every time we dunk on jk rowling for editorializing fandom do a shot you'll be freaking wasted she does <clears throat> She does it like that's she editorializes it and this is an example of doing it she yep. realized how incredibly like the fandoms out there and was like well Slytherins are good too and she's like well fuck I never wrote that so might as well say it like mm -hmm. it, it really is this like terror it's just so not good and it's it's an example and we will talk about it time and time again because that is completely honestly and we'll talk about the rise and fall of J.K. Rowling within the fandom, but that is what that is the final nails on the cob on the coffin is when she started editorializing and dismissing canon. Yep, yep. Um, like my favorite joke, and I totally stole this, but I still say it all the time when I'm talking about Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling needs to Potter less. Like she just needs to Potter less. Um, we don't. We never wanted Potter more. It, it and she needs to stop, please. <laughs> honest don't care what she fucking has to say i don't uh, read the books tumblr did it better mm -hmm. um <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. no i think that we need to come up with like a drinking drinking yeah that's a drinking game for anyone watching the vods if you want to get really drunk let's every time we yell at jk rowling for editorializing canon in any of these episodes yeah do a shot do a shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it's gonna no. keep happening <laughs> again Slytherin problem that there is an entirety house dedicated to being evil in the school mm -hmm. is like so messed up because a like taking and I know this is taking a step farther but what is it telling those kids to be like by the way you're in the evil house yeah uh, like you're the house you're you're the house Voldemort came from and everybody thinks that people from this house are evil and most of your friends are bigots and 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 you know i mean you get it right like you get it this is awful an awful thing to say to a kid yep um and on top of that then why as a teacher who by the way is very against slytherin house because you just awarded 255 points to gryffindor for doing fuck all and breaking the rules why yeah, for do doing something that the police should have handled <laughs> why do you have this house still established Dumbledore why why is Slytherin house still there if they're nothing but evil people why are you allowing them to exist and then be raised to believe that they're evil people because I guarantee you that kids that think that they're going to be raised evil will come out evil yeah it's crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And that's the Slytherin problem. Mm -hmm. Again, understanding that this is children's literature, especially in this first book, like that there is the, the because of children's literature, there is this idea of black and white. But I understand that it's very, very difficult to read as like, people who don't have fandom knowledge to understand why there would be any good qualities in Slytherin because there literally isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, sorry, to go back to the Dumbledore thing, Dumbledore also mentions ambition being one of the worst traits a human or a wizard could have. Yeah. And then literally the tagline of one of the houses is ambition. Mm-hmm. Like it's how freaking crazy. That connection is so important in the idea of this is truly an evil house. These are true oh. people. Katie has a funny comment. Because if you don't have an easy scapegoat, you have to self-reflect instead of divert. Yes, actually. Yep. And that's why um, certain political movements are built on having an underclass or a scapegoat. Yes. Because then they don't have to think about it. They um so yeah so that is how slytherin house is talked about in the books 
Yep. Let's talk about how it is in fandom. Oh, I totally different. Important difference. And I think that that is, that is the, uh, like, purpose. Mm -hmm. um, Slytherin House in fandom is still about ambition, but ambition looks multiple different ways. My favorite person that the fandom has decided is in Slytherin House is Barack Obama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah, incredibly ambitious man, very charming, very cunning, very charismatic, great guy, I would assume from everything I've read about him. Uh, well, what I can say, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would assume he's a great guy. I would assume he's one of the greatest orators of our time. Wonderful speaker. And why wouldn't somebody with all of those, the traits of a Slytherin be an excellent speaker? Why wouldn't they? It makes perfect sense. They, they have the attention loving of a, of a Gryffindor and the charismatic, uh, the charisma and smarts of a Ravenclaw. They should, they are the public speakers of the world. Yeah. I, I truly believe anybody who has had to crawl their way up a ladder inherits some Slytherin-like ideals. Mm -hmm. That ambition is an incredibly key, I mean, it is one of three words that describes Slytherin. It is an incredibly important part. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a dream, like people who have far off dreams and are willing to put in the work and willing to make their way to do it and i'm not talking like putting in the work by like studying i'm talking about like making friends getting to know people all of that kind of stuff that is the kind of slytherin ambition that the fandom has decided is what slytherin is representative of yep um yep because the because the the thing is it's because here's the thing like when the fandom looks at these houses they're most of the time when you're getting into harry potter you're younger right like you're a teenager you're a young adult um, you know, you're, you're similar age to the characters, right? So, of course, at that age, you're still finding yourself, you're still trying to figure out, like, how you fit in. Um, and it's very easy then to look at these houses and be like, well, gosh, if I was part of the wizarding world, what house would I be in? So, you know, it's a very natural, it's a very natural inclination that we're doing. So, and nobody wants to think of themselves as being part of the evil house. So we kind of extrapolate all of these other things and, and decide like, okay, well, Slytherin house, it's really more about ambition. And I said it in a previous, um, in the previous Harry Potter episode that we did on Sorcerer's Stone that like... J.K. Rowling doesn't understand ambition. She thinks of it as something is, is bad. I believe that. And I, I argue in that, that video why I believe that she thinks that. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, with that, the, the thing is, is like, if being ambitious produces evil results, it's not the ambitious person that's the problem. It's your system that's encouraging ambitious people to behave in this way, right? Like, that's the problem. So once again, J.K. Rowling does not under think about things systemically because if she did, if she did, and if Dumbledore is supposedly the best headmaster Hogwarts has ever had, you know what Dumbledore would do? He would say, Slytherin House doesn't exist anymore. We are totally rebranding this house. We're giving it different traits. We're totally reorganizing how this works. And this new system either is not going to be houses or it's not going to include a house of amb ambition that, that somehow ends up with all the bigots in it, right? Like he would abolish it if he was that smart. But J.K. Rowling's not not that smart, so she can't make Dumbledore do that. And again, uh. and again, this is children's, like, at this point in time, when the systems were created, it was children's lit. So it didn't yeah. have to be that deep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the problem is, is that throughout the entire book, because it never gets developed more or doesn't get developed with the depth that it deserves as the rest of the world gets developed, it remains that shallow. Yeah. And it doesn't have to, because a lot of other parts of the book grow up and, and, and deepen and, you know, and get way more complex, but not this. Yeah, you do see in some areas where her world building of systems makes sense. The Ministry of Magic, uh, the laws and rules and regulation of magic, the way magic interacts in the world. Like, these are all things that will continue to deepen and grow that we know J.K. Rowling is capable of that level of world building mm -hmm. but because the house system stops becoming important after this because the stakes of other things continue to grow higher and the stakes are too low it never becomes developed it becomes it, it never becomes developed so it continues to be oh they're slither and they're evil
-hmm. like that you would think that as the rest of the books in the world develops that would be developed as well and maybe it doesn't happen in the sorcerer's stone maybe that's a discussion that happens in order of the phoenix where it's almost hinted at where the world like Sirius' famous line of the world isn't split up into good people and death eaters Mm -hmm. um but there's like this idea that he says that line and then every single death eater comes from Slytherin. Like, <laughs> like, but it, but actually it kind of is, it kind of is in these books. Your mouth is. Like, <laughs> great quote. And maybe that for Harry would like awaken something that he'd realize that not all Slytherins are evil or that J.K. Rowling could take that opportunity and then start writing characters where Slytherins aren't evil, but that doesn't happen. Yeah. It's like tell versus show. We get told this, but we're never shown like, where, where is it? Where does that happen? It doesn't. It doesn't. Look nope. at them. They're so cute, by the way. I'm just looking <laughs> and swing back and forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just kind of See? letting them do their thing. I think Tormund's about to grow up. Ooh, fun. Um, yeah. yeah. So so Slytherin is definitely this like public speaker, politician, easy talker. Uh, ambitious sort of vibe that isn't bad and isn't isn't inherently bad and isn't inherently good because I think that that's the other thing that fandom did is that they tried really hard to balance it out that they didn't want bad and good to be so black and white Mm -hmm. and I do think that's that's a huge a huge thing in transformative works is finding you know what in the source material is not as good as it could be and, and making it better right so this is this is a common theme that you see in fandom and transformative work because of course the work of thousands or tens of thousands of people when it comes to harry potter is always going to be more intelligent and more satisfying than the work of one person and a team of editors duh that you know <laughs> duh uh you know just the the brain power of all of those people so you know you see you see this element of the books that's like oh this is kind of flawed it could be better um, and fandom like totally latches onto it and makes it that thing that it could have been. Yep. Do we want to talk about how the other houses are portrayed in the books, at least from the? Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I mentioned this a little bit as the resident Ravenclaw. I just want to speak on this. So I mentioned this a little bit that <laughs> um, that the other houses really just exist as characters to be dated, and yep. um, and that's really true in the books when you think about the other. Uh, Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs. Luna is the only example that I don't, I think doesn't quite fit this, but they're really just, they're just hotties. Like, <laughs> that's it. You know, Cho Chang, somebody for Harry to date. Um, you know, uh, Cedric Diggory, someone for the girls to drool over. <laughs> Go ahead, Landon. Uh, Cedric Diggory, somebody for the girls to drool over, right? I know. I was making a bisexual Harry joke. It's fine. Oh, go for it. Oh, I was just saying Cedric Diggory, a person for Harry to date. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I should have said that. Oh, oh well. Anyways, we'll talk about we'll talk about bisexual Harry as as he as he grows up. Um, that is a thought that we have. In the fourth book, we'll talk about bisexual mm-hmm. Harry because mm-hmm. of Cedric Diggory. Mm-hmm. Yep, and um, and uh, and Sirius Black to a lesser extent, but yes, we'll talk so about so much that. daddy issues in Sirius Black. It's fine. Oh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> get ready y'all it's so fun that's the title of that book it's the title of that this uh, episode by the way is the daddy issues of serious black uh, ah! <laughs> but no i i agree that there there aren't any examples of of gryffindor or or not gryffindor of ravenclaw or hufflepuff outside of one luna lovegood and uh who also is supposed to become a love interest. I think for ne- originally it happened in the movie, didn't happen in the book, but was originally also supposed to be a love interest for Neville. Yep. She was. You could, uh, sh- in my Rowling's heart, she still Neville. is. In, in my heart, she still is. She never married she whatever is. his name Scamander is. That didn't happen. Pottermore yeah, so- can say what it, what it wants. <laughs> so even then she still is a love interest of a character. Like mm-hmm. that is, that is the, that was the original purpose of her. Um, so you have like, yeah, there isn't representation. And even if you look at the adults in Harry's life through the books, the, we might come across someone else, um, who isn't as we read the books and maybe we'll talk about it through that. But the only one that comes to mind as far as like professors is, um, 
Gilderoy Lockhart, who's apparently a Ravenclaw, and I've already expressed that's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why he's Ravenclaw. He's not very I don't creative. Get it. He's not very clever, or he's not very book smart, um, and he's not really like long term thinking type A. Uh, no. It doesn't make any sense why he's a Ravenclaw in my in yeah. My he head. he has he has none of none of the other Ravenclaw traits. Which again, that's why the way that fandom fixes it is it's not about your actual traits or what you're good at. It's about what you value right and even then i don't think he values it because he doesn't value hermione who no maybe at, maybe at like, 11 years old he did who knows um but yeah it, he doesn't it doesn't seem like he does does it no it doesn't so and, and as far as i can think of i don't think that there is any other characters that really are developed of any sort of development mm -hmm. that belong to other houses not really um, Not really. Tonks is a Hufflepuff. That's the only other one that comes to mind. Yeah, Tonks, Tonks really. Tonks doesn't get a lot of development either, except for through her being Remus's new squeeze. And I was gonna say, and that is the thing with, and we will continue to talk about this as well through this series. But Tonks is an example of a character that I like to call blank slate. And that is that there are three traits you can name about Tonks and the fandom then does the work to project a personality onto her. Yep. Yeah, um, and that's exactly what Mochi's talking about right now. But yeah, that rebellious chill vibe, like it's, it's just a tiny snippet in the book, right? And yeah. then we develop it. She's clumsy and she loves Remus Lupin. Those are literally her three traits that are mm -hmm. really, really expanded upon in the book or developed in any sort of way, everything else is a projection of how fandom wanted to see her. Yep. Someone that, she is someone that because there was an unrelatable, there's an unrelatable main character cast. So there's only one girl, which means that all the teenage girls that didn't represent with Hermione couldn't feel like they were a part of the Harry Potter series. And then Ron and Harry are very distinctive personalities that any other person who didn't feel like they were belonging to those personalities couldn't relate to the Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. So Jake Rowling has made a cast full of characters who you could project yourself onto. Whether that was the intention or not, who knows? But that is what has happened. And that is why fandom started like a wildfire for all of these characters. Mm -hmm. There's so many examples of just wonderful like side characters that um that don't have a lot of development in harry potter that you can just add so much to by the way it's about to be baby Tormund's birthday so he's gonna grow up i think they keep trying they keep the game keeps trying to do it and then not do it but i i hope that he'll go ahead and grow up because then we continue the trend of important life moments happening in our underwear it's not happening though i don't think it's gonna happen it almost did <sighs> Yep. she's juggling okay, okay. Yep. She, we love landon so much we so. do <laughs> no but I yeah and, and i mean uh talking about how does tonks feel about gender because she can shape shift that's a wonderfully valid question that i think a more thoughtful author probably would have put some you know some hints into the book for that but they don't exist in <laughs> But let's, let's, I want to, because I think that this is a bigger conversation, but I do want to like define what the houses are for fandom perspective. Yeah. So in Harry Potter, Ravenclaw is supposed to be clever, creative, and, and witty. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're the book smart people is mm -hmm. how until Luna Lovegood, they're book smart. And then after Luna Lovegood, they're also acceptable as, as wise and creative. Mm -hmm. Um, but as fandom, again, it is that idea of being able to like be organized, be able to be type A, be able to like push things forward. Um, not just be book smart, but also be smart in a multitude of ways, be creative. What other things did you find in the Ravenclaw fandom that you connected with maybe? So I think um, I think that the Ravenclaw fandom, a lot of it is is extrapolated from from Luna Lovegood. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not just necessarily the book smarts, although that is a huge part of it. Another huge part of the Ravenclaw fandom is like anybody that doesn't feel like they fit in, that they felt like they were kind of the weirdos. So I know a lot of like theater kids 
identify with Ravenclaw. A lot of band kids identify with Ravenclaw. A lot of kids that were super into anime identify with Ravenclaw. So when I was coming along, um, you know, at reading Harry Potter uh, along with similar ages that the that the characters in the books were, and my friends were all reading Harry Potter and stuff like that too, the ones of us that identified with Ravenclaw were were, were basically the ones of us that weren't very afraid of our nerd side, you know? And then my friends that were a little bit more... Um, uh, am either ambivalous or disliking their nerd side because all my friends were nerds like let's be real um i didn't have a, many non-nerd friends but the ones that were either ambivalent or not so happy with their nerd side tended to more identify with either um slytherin or hufflepuff right and then the ones of us that were like not so embarrassed about it tended to identify with ravenclaw that was my experience you know with um with uh, the harry potter fandom online as well as the Harry Potter fandom and how it affected me and my my friends, you know, that was really what Ravenclaw was. It's a bunch of nerds. It's a bunch of nerds. Well, I agree with that, and I think that also the landscape of like what defines a nerd has changed in the last fifteen oh, years. Oh yeah. And so as fandom has taken that, it has changed with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would agree, it is that like nerdy fraction, that geeky faction of people. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It does yeah. feel like high, high school stereotypes, Katie. It really <laughs> Um, so then we have Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff, who in the book are described as the others. Kind, loyal, hardworking are the words described with them, but also like Gryffindor is supposed to be loyal. So like, what? And then hardworking, everyone is supposed to be hardworking. So it really is the leftovers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that are described in the book. I know with a lot of my Hufflepuff friends, and there's like they're meek and quiet and the support they're supporting side characters uh kind i know of. i know from yeah. my friends that this is not this is not it <laughs> like this is not how fandom saw them uh they're the they're the hard-working people who are like do like i always ex like to see it in fandom where it was like Oh, the Gryffindors are the one being outspoken, and the Hufflepuffs are like, okay, but how are we actually going to do this? <laughs> like, saying that you want this change, but then how do we change it? Okay, we can do this, and then this, and then like build the home. So the Gryffindor is like, we're gonna build a house, and the Hufflepuffs are being like, I guess we're building a house. <laughs> Let's figure out how to do that. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Um, no, I think that that's accurate as far as the way that the that the fandom has um has taken those and uh, and changed them over time. Yeah. Um. Absolutely, I would agree with all those. And then we have the big one, which is Gryffindor. Yes. And this is the this is the most proof that we have the most proof in uh in the media for and how fandom has changed that. So in the media, we have Gryffindors are the good guys. Mm -hmm. They're brave. They commit murder. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> they really did. Um, they're they're like dedicated. They're strong, willed, not just strong in body. Although, um... <laughs> <laughs> what Oliver Wood? I don't, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I never loved a guy who only had one seed and three books more, but Oliver mm. Wood, my mm. man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think, um, and then there's like, I don't know. It's, it's hard, I think, because Gryffindor is told that we are the good guys, but then we see this vast variety of people inside of Gryffindor, and none of them necessarily have any connecting traits. Right, yeah. you have Neville, who is supposedly Gryffindor, and doesn't connect to like Fred and George. Like those two characters are very different and see the world very differently and act very different, but they're supposed to be the same. They're supposed yeah. to fit under this umbrella of bravery and courage and God knows what else. <laughs> yeah, we don't really know, right? We don't really know. So, how did fandom change this? Fandom changed this by making Gryffindors the frat boys that they are. Uh, <laughs> the jocks. The no. They're doing it here for sports. Yeah. I think Gryffindor, if you're a Gryffindor and you're watching this, 
I love you. That took a lot of, that lot, took a lot to say for me to say it, but I do love you. Um, but I think because we only had access to Gryffindor, Gryffindor within the fandom kind of has become a joke. Yeah, nobody wants to be Gryffindor. Not in the oh, fandom. Yeah. It's like, what? Why would you want that? Yeah, I think it's it's like, why would you want that? But it's also like, it's so generic. Kind of, yeah. Uh, that like, well, like my friend for the longest time was like, I'm a Gryffindor. And I'm like, honey, you deserve so much more than that. <gasps> um, oh, no. <laughs> was that to me? Yeah, that was to your oh. poor friend. Oh, yeah, no, she's she's seen the air of her wave. She's really a Ravenclaw. Um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Like I said, the only people that I know that identify with um, with uh, Gryffindor are not part of the fandom. They simply just enjoyed the books and movies. Yeah, but she was very much like, well, I'm really into social justice and protesting and, and systemic change. She's a social worker, uh, mm. helping other people. And I sit there and I go, love, you can do all of that from all the other houses. <laughs> Yeah, that's not unique to Gryffindor. Just because, just because we're told that Gryffindors are the only people who would protest doesn't, that's not true, right? That doesn't that, really make sense, right? That's not true at all. Um, and, and, and it was like this, so it's like really this idea of, of Gryffindor is just good and the inherent good of the world and the moral forwardness mm -hmm. um, that the, that we have in the media that we like take and it goes, no, Gryffindors really are just the people who kind of have the ideas. They're mm -hmm. the idea. They're the people mm -hmm. that are like, let's build a house. <laughs> uh, and I mean, the world, go. okay. And the world still needs quarterbacks. Okay. Like Absolutely. we're not saying that like, oh that's God. a bad thing. It's no. just that that's what it is though. <laughs> but it, it wasn't just the Gryffindor who built the house just because yeah. Gryffindor had the idea to do it doesn't mean that it, they just built the house um it is it is that like oh it, it takes a lot of work and Gryffindors are great at being that front person they're great at being the person who'd be like actually we need a round of waters or we need more silverware like they're that friend mm -hmm. <laughs> who's mm -hmm. willing to speak for the whole group and the whole table when you have socially awkward people mm -hmm. um but at the same time that doesn't mean that like they're the only ones who can stand up for justice and good and change yeah even though in the media we are told that they are like yeah as far in, the, as they in the books book. that that in the books it's that's how it is <laughs> so that that really is the, how the books see all of these houses versus how fandom has warped them and, and changed them mm -hmm. um and of course every person is individual and so we'll see the houses in individual ways um especially like with the biasism of what they align with because someone who is in Gryffindor might see Gryffindor very differently than someone who is in Slytherin. Right. Well, because again, and this would be true in the books too, I think the characters would probably feel this way because they're only interacting with their house really. So they're going to see the diversity within their house that exists, right? Like if you were actually attending Hogwarts, that's how you would feel. But since yeah. you don't interact with the, the characters that are in the, the other houses, you would see those houses as whatever their stereotype is. Yep. So I think this would be a good time to start talking about the like diving into the fact that J.K. Rowling didn't make the houses we did, mm -hmm. and the why. And we've kind of talked about the whys behind that, but the whys that is so important to the fandom. Yeah. Um. First and foremost, like let's talk about what it did for like the capitalist side of all of this. Yeah, the, um, the turning Harry Potter into a brand, like for that side of it, right? If you took out houses, what kind of what kind of merch would there be? None. Like there isn't a lot of merch. Not really. Um, Nobody wants like merch of specific characters, right? Like the only merch that really exists that's popular of specific characters is like replications of certain characters' wands, right? Yeah. That's the only piece of merch I can think of that's like actually character related. Almost well, all of the merch that actually sells is related to the houses. 
And again, that's because, well, several factors there, right? Um, because merch with characters means movie faces, which means then anything that Warner Brothers gets has to be cut with them. Well, so yeah. like that's not direct to J.K. Rowling and the book publishing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is an important factor to take into this. Second, secondly, uh, side characters, all of these side characters, again, there are so many of them and so many of them are blank slates thinking Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, Tonks, um, you know, Seamus, Seamus, uh, not Diggory, uh, Seamus and Dean, yep. Thomas. Um, yeah, all of these characters are very like fill in the blank Mad Lib style characters. Yep. So you can't have merch based off of these characters because the purpose of them is to be ambiguous. Nope, that's ambiguous. Thank yeah, you, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for people to then feel that they are attached to them. So they can't do anything defined with that stuff. Also, there's too many characters to do that with every character. Yep. Uh, and then no one likes the trio, except maybe Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I think if you read the books, then Ron is pretty likable. But um, but uh, if you watch the movies, Hermione's pretty likable. And then nobody likes Harry, no matter what. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but with wands, with wands, right, there's a whole idea of you can collect them. You can have your favorites. They're art pieces. So they're like not, they're not direct marketing merch, right? They're mm -hmm. like, they, they can well, be. Well, they're very expensive. They're very expensive. Whether, uh, whether you get the official ones or fandom ones, because they just take a lot to produce. They do. Yeah. So it is, so like that is the merch that exists that doesn't have to do. And then you have the Hogwarts crest stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some like, some things from the book. So you have like a time turner or Hermione's dress or uh, like Hedwig, um, a few, a few Romilia, memorabilia here and there but really the majority of the merch sales within the harry potter universe is house items mm -hmm. everything from pajama bottoms to socks to shirts to binders notepads hair clips everything ties uniforms all of those are incredibly based on the house system mm-hmm um, which means that the world has to be about the houses because yep. that's what the merch is dependent upon. Yep. yep. Um, which is why I also think as we go later in the books, we also see that that's another reason why things don't change is because she can't then start critiquing the house system because then she might not make as many sales. As well, because then she'd be critiquing her fans by proxy. And all yeah. of this, by the way, a lot of this development happened during the long uh, summer. So for those of you guys that were not in the fandom when it was like at when the content was being developed right like when the books were coming out when the movies were coming out just to give some further context um this there was a there was a point i think it was in between book three and four or was it in between book four and five four, four and five okay so in between book four and five because normally the books had been releasing about every like 12 to 14 months before then right and then in between book four and five there was a couple of years before we got book five and um and due to that we were making so much stuff like so much stuff um we were writing fanfic fan art we were you know developing uh things in the universe more like the fandom was just exploding because there was no new content so we were making it and that's really when all of this stuff with the houses happened and um and uh hey landon's Hi. mom <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lennon's mom. Um, so, uh, so that's when all of this stuff was was happening, and uh, and we were and and we were kind of you know doing all of this. So there was this there was this gap in content. So all of these things that we've talked about that exist in the books in in an underdeveloped way, plus the the couple of years gap in in canon content meant that if we were going to continue to be Harry Potter fans. And, and participate in, in, in fandom and in transformative works, we had to pump out a ton of stuff. So that's when, to my recollection, when all of this stuff was happening. 
Yeah, and not only did you have that, but you also had the fact that the first movie came out that year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so many people who hadn't been reading the books were suddenly invited to read the books. Yep. So you had, not only did like the the fans that had been steadily, the fan base that had been steadily growing over the course of four years continue to grow, you had an explosion of new mm -hmm. fans in yep. that last year of the wait. I think it was a two and a half year period between four and five. That sounds uh, so right. That last year, the Sorcerer's Stone movie came out and the entire fandom exploded. So you, now you had more people, um, more people engaging in it and have consumed it to a rate that is faster that has made more people obsessed, right? Because the faster you consume media, the more like you want and the more you're left wanting. So mm -hmm. if you've read all the books and you still have nine months to go and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? You start creating mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it happens in a lot of fandoms. Yep. So yeah, it is this explosion of more, uh, more, more content, more people, more things, internet becoming, becoming wildly more available. The fans were starting to grow up of different ages. Mm -hmm. uh, which means that like they were like the, the fan art was improving because people were older and were getting more practice yep. uh, writing was improving um the internet itself was changing fanfiction.com i think started existing around that year yeah fanfiction.net um, not... but yeah 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 uh, so um, like, but yeah uh, like it was uh, it was crazy it was crazy because like there was enough harry potter fan stuff to go around that there were multiple there were like half a dozen different harry yeah. potter dedicated harry potter fan fiction sites and 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 drama between them <laughs> like it was oh insane God. yeah you could get kicked off if you were on two of them like there was yes! a lot of drama happening um and then all of a sudden this big place this big website this dot net came in and allowed an entire hub of not just harry potter fan fiction but fan fiction from all fandoms yeah and it bloated there mm -hmm. so all of a sudden you didn't have to sneak around from fandom to f page to fandom page or or pick your favorites or anything like that there was one universal place you could get your fan fiction mm -hmm. um you know like and even though wattpad existed or live journal existed at that point like it was hard to search through this was super easy there was different ways of doing it like it really was like the renaissance of the harry potter fandom happened in this long summer yeah it was like and it was right before it was like a couple of years before um social media became a thing so it was really like the heyday of web 1.0 um yeah. the best time of the internet really in in total <laughs> let's be real and and, and this is the, this is also when i started uh i didn't start engaging with online forum until after the fifth book uh because i was still pretty young um i was only i was 12 or 13 at this point um, but did start engaging like with other things that were being created that weren't just fandom specific. So there was also encyclopedias about Harry Potter being published during these times. Mm -hmm. So it was like they were they were like the unofficial encyclopedia of Harry Potter and it was like predictions of what was gonna happen in the next book or just these things that were like unofficial publications that were happening. Um, so like, not only was it, it happening online, but there was also a market in the bookstores that was exploding as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so fandom just went crazy. <laughs> yeah. Harry Potter fandom was like a wild thing. Uh, um, so then, yeah. And so then the first movie came out, which means merch sales, even then skyrocketed because there was now more material and more people who were willing to buy merch, mm -hmm. um, really did have to keep the house system intact for this purpose yeah yep as weird as it was as weird um, as it was they couldn't make too many changes to it because people by the time by the time this was happening people were were hella attached so you really only had like the first four books that um that anything could have been could have happened and and it didn't and recognizing that we were all also very young so we weren't questioning it because I think that that's the other part is that we look at what this did to the fandom, not just to capitalism. Um, we were a bunch of geeky people who wanted to find fellow geeky people that were like-minded and feel like we belonged to something. And literally the house system did that for us. Mm -hmm. It gave us <laughs> like, all, it gave us all these nice, neat, fun labels and an easy way to hang out with people. 
and it was just and the thing about the books and we talked about this in the sorcerer's Stone episode a big part of the books is 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 that the extraordinary is good and so you know the the people the people that are looked down upon the people that are that are abused the people that are bullied like they're the good people and everybody has felt that way at some point in their youth so it was just this wonderful thing the harry potter fandom was just this wonderful thing where we could all get together and feel like we belonged and and the houses gave us this wonderful tool to like make that happen yeah and it, it made us feel like there was content that we could create there and be supported by people mm -hmm. um I also think it made friendships really easy because you're like, I'm a Hufflepuff. You're like, if someone else is like, I'm a Hufflepuff, you know that they, you assume that they have the same values as you. Mm -hmm. Because of what Hufflepuff means. Yeah. Because of what Slytherin means. You can assume that they feel somewhat similar or the same way as you. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating, uh, turn it's a fascinating way of of that we as a fandom made connection mm -hmm. um and of course it was going to stick of course being able to box teenagers in groups that they felt accepted and who they could truly be and labeled because we as humans as much as we hate labels love labels um <laughs> perfect <Yeah>. <laughs> it 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 made sense and then the the this like capitalism could feed off of that success yep. mm -hmm. um, but i also think what that did is it united the fandom in such a unique way because as a fandom we had to come together and define this broken system of houses and then we realized the power that we had to continue yep. to define other things in the books yep and and whenever this happened a uh, uh, ya just exploded with yes. these these other books that had like you know categorizations of people but the, the problem is is a lot of those other books oh sorry did you have something to oh, say i was that? just gonna i was gonna list some like divergent hunger games oh yeah yeah percent. like mm -hmm. there's ex there's countless examples of ya of of trying to split people into groups that never worked successfully after. right and here's why it didn't work here's why it didn't work so this is the magic of it so uh, you look into harry potter and you think like oh the houses is everything that's how they're making money that's how they're selling merch da da da, da. i need my book to do that right like or or a publishing house is like i want more books that, that we can do that with like right like i want our i want our you know merch um you know empire on whatever categories right but the thing is is that in all of those books hunger games and divergent like the ones you just listed the, the, the way that people are sectioned off, the groupings are integral to the story and the world. And in Harry Potter, they're not. And that's why fans can latch onto it in a way that they can't in those other books. Divergent, by the way, awful. Awful categorization system and the, the except for the first book, they're really bad books. But anyways, it's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but like... Eh. The other, the other books that try to do this can't. And the reason that they can't is because they think that the most, most important thing in Harry Potter is the houses, but it's not. The houses yeah. are like, uh, really don't do much except to tell you when you're looking at an evil character or who and is you know, the main character. And you know what? I do not blame authors for this. I think this truly belongs to publishing houses. Mm -hmm. Because I I truly believe that if we had originally gotten Veronica Roth's version of what the divergent sections were, it would have been different because you can feel the marketability being edited into this, right? You they think so? wanted to like the Candor house or the divergent house or not divergent or whatever, the mm -hmm. re restless or whatever the different houses or factions were. Yeah. Um, if it was left, if it, because of the success of Harry Potter, um, if it wasn't trying to be marketed that way, I don't think there would have been as much of an issue. Mm -hmm. I think that this is purely a publishing house problem that they saw the success Harry Potter had with the houses and went, we need more like that. And then nothing has been able to recreate it because it wasn't under pressure like that. Mm -hmm. Well, because the houses, the houses weren't really the important part. And I don't think anybody realized that until they kept trying to produce the same success over and over and never could. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Um, yep. And, so the, if and, you want to make another Harry Potter, make a categorization system that fans will like that doesn't actually matter to your book. There you go. There's the formula. <laughs> oh, a cronk. Okay. Oh, we're trying cool. for a baby. I assume that's why Katie did that. We're going to see. Landon wants another baby, so we're trying. Oh, we're trying for another. We're trying for another child. Mm hmm. <laughs> And she just got a promotion, so this is a good time. And there she is. She got we got the chimes. Landon's pregnant again, y'all. Landon's pregnant. But yes, it's really this it's, it's really this interesting um like yeah, I, I think what I love most about the houses is that it really did, even though it's like a it's a separation tactic within the media, within the book. It's a way of separating students. It's a way of like ostracizing different houses from each other, of making sure that there isn't no inner house unit unity or anything like that. We as a fandom was like, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> <And we just laughs> never treated it that way. Yeah, we were like, um, that's dumb. We're not doing that. <laughs> we literally just used it as like a whatever sort of like an identifier rather than a club mm -hmm. um, it was just like a it was like a pin just being like yeah i'm slytherin cool um rather than a i'm a slytherin and no one can no one can be friends with me unless you're slytherin yeah yeah that was never the case that was never the case i mean the only time that, that ever happened is like when it, when the early fandom hufflepuff was the house nobody liked right and now gryffindor's the house nobody likes so there i think i feel like there's always been like a house that people were like mm, what whatever i don't i'm not whatever um but other than that that's been the closest thing that we've ever had to like the houses being separated the way that they are in the books yeah exactly and i and because of that again i think it brought together this like understanding like <sighs> It's almost also an entry level into fandom. Yeah. Right? It was like, for a lot of people, a lot of people's entry point, regardless of their age. Yeah, exactly. It's like this idea of understanding of what house do you belong to? Mm -hmm. It's a universal question that you can ask any Harry Potter fan and then have an instant connection with, which makes yep. the fandom feel as, as toxic and as gross and as unkind as it can be in some points in history and some points in corners of the fandom even currently overall it makes like this welcomely like welcoming easy way to just like talk and make connection mm -hmm. yeah which is a really cool way for us to all feel interconnected so that we could truly see the power that the fandom has because the fandom is so unique in the amount of power that it it holds well it's like it's one of the biggest fandoms that um that at least i've ever been a part of and every other big fandom I've been a part of has been like more toxic and more ridiculous. You know what I mean? At least in my experience, right? Um, which I find very interesting. Katie, it's a it's a kid's toy. It's a it's just a kid's toy. It's not really a severed bunny head. <laughs> oh, I love the idea that there is a severed bunny. Head <laughs> it's just a kid's head. toy. Um, but yeah, if I think about like all the other fandoms that I've been a part of and um, and had experience in. Um, as far as like large fandoms go, uh, Harry Potter, I've probably experienced the least amount of um, awfulness. And I don't know if that's just because it's a very old fandom it has been around a long time. And so a lot of us are, that are in the Harry Potter fandom are much older now. Um, or, or if the internet was just such a different place back then, probably all of those things. Um, but yeah, I, I do still love the Harry Potter fandom a lot. I also think it, um, it has certainly had it's war like shipping like we will talk about shipping wars oh god uh, there are certainly shipping war examples in the harry potter fandom mm -hmm. that have gotten pretty nasty yeah um but that that being said it doesn't necessarily like it, it overall really kind mm -hmm. and really many different levels and many different places of entry um yeah. But automatically, like, suddenly being brought into a house makes you feel, like, included. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think, unpopular opinion, pot the Pottermore test, I really appreciate it. 
uh, recognizing that I also got Slytherin 13 out of the 14 times I took it. <laughs> so I felt valid in my, in my choices. Uh, I did really appreciate that because I think it gave everyone a access point to sit there and be like, oh, you don't know? Let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for those of you that didn't get your house on Pottermore, uh, Pottermore's trash. That's, that's all I'll, that's what I'll say about that. But if you did get your house, then Pottermore is wonderful, right? Like that's the, that's the deal there. <laughs> that is the deal there. Although the wand, wand thing, pretty cool because I was not sold on like what kind of wand I had. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, oh, cool. This is awesome. I will actually, I will actually say if, if Pottermore was just those quizzes and really nothing else as far as content was, then I wouldn't hate it so much, you know? Yeah. If it was just those quizzes, I would think Pottermore is a fun little website. Oh, yeah. That's the only thing I'm referring to. I've read nothing else. Yeah. That's not true. I've read a lot. I refuse to believe anything else. Yeah, I, I read it and then get immediately upset. <laughs> another shot for all of those playing the drinking game at home. Uh, Pottermore sucks because it's just an excuse for J.K. Rowling to uh, editorialize. Continue Karen. to milk the only good thing she's ever written. And also... Uh, it explains that Cursed Child is canon, which is the stupidest fucking thing I have ever heard. I hate Cursed Child. Oh my god, do we have to read that for this series? Yeah, oh, we do. No. We have to read Cursed Child and talk about how awful it is. Oh no. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh. It's fine. Landon's gonna lose her mind. It'll be good. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry, just had to say. Yes, Katie, that's where you told where, you, where your house is. Yep, yep. So, Among other things. Yeah, and again, it's like, it, it's because they're, because the fandom opened up the definitions of each house and also accepted that there are multiple layers and complexity and complex, like the complexities, that's a word, I'm going with it, of human beings that you could be multiple things at multiple points in time and that maybe one house doesn't speak to you and that's valid. Like the fact that the fandom opened that up I think really also added to the relatability to people who didn't necessarily relate to any of the houses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And also standing upon those houses and just being like, yeah, no, Slytherin's not just the evil assholes. They're also the people who are like really good at parties. <laughs> Why not, right? The fandom did that to make it more balanced. Yeah, they're the ones that were really my favorite. My favorite has always been the Tumblr things that have like defined the aesthetic of each house. Oh yeah, and like, it being like Slytherin House's really pointed wing eyeliner, and I'm like, yes, that is the aesthetic I wish I had. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, um, I'm here for that. I like that. I loved it. I was like, it's not even describing the personalities of each house; it's describing the hypothetical aesthetics that I truly find beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and that is the kind of fandom I want but see that's what the houses are really and the way that the tw that uh that uh fandom has actually treated them is aesthetic okay. right mm -hmm. they're not meaningful in the way that they are in the first book they really are just like what Harry Potter aesthetic are you as part of the Harry Potter fandom and I think um and I think that this is that it's easy to assign aesthetics to Harry Potter houses and l less easy to assign actual personality traits as what, you know, the way that they're portrayed in the book. Because of, um, oh, thank you so much for the, the follow, um, Awkward Rainbow Soul. I am also an Awkward Rainbow Soul. Thank you. Um, I th Landon, I think you are too, right? I think we can no, all be I'm Awkward perfect, Rainbow Souls. I'm perfectly not awkward. Um, okay. Anyways, I love you. <laughs> Yeah, the child grew up. The child grew up, Katie. Um, so, so I think. So when I think of, oh, hang on. Uh, lady wants up. Here we go. You can lay right here, lady. Um, so, so when I think of like the Harry Potter houses, it, it really, it really is an aesthetic, and I think that that's so easy to, in the books because there's all of these characters that are just side characters with tiny, tiny like a bit of their personality that the fandom can expand on. Because these side characters, they're really all just an aesthetic, right? And there's a plethora of them. There's so many in the books, and and there's so many characters that all we know about them is like one or two personality traits, 
and sometimes we know their house right and it's so fun for the ones that we don't to assign a house to them like you know i love that you know me and my me and my um, marauders era you know oh what house would like ludo bagman be what house would alistair moody be what how you know what i mean um like i love that what house would um what's another one uh, what's that what's what's like some of the, the girl yeah yeah, like what house would they be? So obviously Slytherin. Um, yeah, but but some of them aren't so obvious, right? Like the ones that are part of um, the no. that are part of the Order of the Phoenix are not so obvious, right? So like assigning houses to all the Order of the Phoenix members, you know, things like that. I find so so fun, and because the characters are not well developed, right, and the house system is kind of broken, I'm able to do that. So it's kind of a blessing that J.K. Rowling was less, less talented than she could have been in writing these things. <laughs> There are some things, because I also think that if she had the uh, bigoted perspective and had put that into the writing at this point in time, we wouldn't have fallen in love with this book series as much. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. So, yeah, I think that yeah. that's, that's what makes it beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is. It is. So, like, I think I think for, for the fandom... The way that we've really landed on like Harry Potter houses as an aesthetic more than anything else, um, I think is like, you know, that's super valid. And and as far as fandom is concerned, they really shouldn't be anything else. There's really there's really nothing else that um, that the houses can easily serve. Um, I'm in Ravenclaw, Aqua Rainbow Soul. What um what house are you in? And don't worry about interrupting. We do this on Twitch knowing we're going to get interruptions. We welcome them. We're happy to be interrupted by our viewers. We appreciate it even more. Mm -hmm. We do. So interrupt away. Interrupt away. But uh, but yeah, so, so for those of y'all that don't know, Landon and I met in a... Um, in a Marauders era Harry Potter role play, so so we we met in our, our one of our early bonding experiences was uh, was sorting Harry Potter characters into houses who never got houses. Low key, not sure. I feel like a mix of Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff. Well, Mochi, this is what I do. If you're not sure, if you feel like a pull between multiple houses, which house do you think you would have felt the most pull to when you were eleven? That's probably your house, right? Because that's when you're sorted. Or flip a coin. That's what I would say. <laughs> no, and I also, I think, um, I love doing it with everybody, though. I love giving, like, I, it's a fun sorting system for me to sit mm -hmm. there and be like, oh, yeah, that character, obvious Slytherin. Mm -hmm. Aaron Burr, <laughs> Slytherin. Ha Alexander Hamilton, Slytherin. George <laughs> Washington, Gryffindor. <laughs> <laughs> Eliza. <laughs> no, see, I could do this with the entire Hamilton cast because I love doing it. Mm -hmm. that is and that's and there's so much Harry Potter um there's so much Harry Potter like fan art and crossover fanfics and things like that that are clearly just a vehicle to sort your favorite in, insert other fandom character into Harry Potter houses right yeah no it really it's 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 fun it's my favorite mm -hmm. game yeah what house is this oh the game yeah so we play Sims too so during some of our streams that are that are more like um, kind of fandom topics or role play topics or things like that. We're playing through a Sims 2 legacy right now. We're on the first generation though. So you're seeing it early. You can start with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, yep. I know it's a little early, but I feel that we've wrapped up this conversation pretty well. I think we have too. I think we have too. Oh, Awkward Rainbow Souls is Slytherin. Wonderful. Most of my friends are Slytherin. Um, and if they're not Slytherin, they're Ravenclaw. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying it because if I didn't say it, I wouldn't be a Slytherin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's true. true. It's true. Oh, Malcolm's going to tuck in his kid. Okay, go back to sleep. Okay, I want to get. Let me get Malcolm in bed, and then I think we will wrap up stream. Because I think you're right. I think we've we've said what we want to say. Uh oh, Malcolm, stop glitching out. Come here. And we did make a lot of progress in our legacy. Um, so just to kind of recap on that, I mean, where's his job? So Malcolm has his dream career now. He's in athletics and he's a, he's a level three. Um, Landon is also a level three in, in her career. Um, and uh, Tormund is a child now. 
he's he's uh, he's a toddler. He's moving along. And uh, Landon's pregnant with her second one. If it's a girl, it's going to be named Lily. So Brie gave us that name. And yeah. if it's a boy, it's going to be named, um, let's see, we just got a new name Kronk. in here. Oh, yeah, Katie says Kronk. So if it's a boy, it's going to be named Kronk. If it's a girl, it's going to be named Lily. Both of which is, have been my favorite ships, or some of my favorite ships that I've shipped with. L- Lily's for my James Potter and mm-hmm. Kronk for, oh my God, who did I ship Kronk with? In our in our Disney role play, yeah. Who did who was Kronk shipped with? Because we didn't have an Isma. Yeah, it was that Meg. was right. It was Kronk and Meg. And Kronk so we had it. We've had Disney role plays too, by the way, a couple of them. Um, <laughs> and yeah, Kronk and um, from Emperor's New Groove, and then Meg from uh, Hercules was a ship in yeah. one of them. Which, if you think hard about it, good ship. Just say it. It is. It is. It was a very good ship. Okay, we're gonna save this. Save Disney and exit. Are- <clears throat> All right. Yeah, our Disney so, RPs were fun. The article I have is good news, but it's not on the Good News Network. Okay. Uh, and it's a little political, but That's okay. I felt it was necessary because it's still June. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Harry Potter, so obviously turf is involved. Yeah. So this is good news that people might have heard that happened this week. But Title IX, which here in the United States is an amendment uh, that basically says that education can't be you can't discriminate against uh gender uh, or race for and sexuality for um for education purposes uh it also was upheld that it can't be discriminated against transgender students either oh that's wonderful so uh if there is discrimination within the court within the school system now if you brought against uh judges or there's a lawsuit or anything like that title IX does protect them and it means that schools have to take into consideration transgender youth when writing their policies oh my gosh that's uh, wonderful amazing because it, it just, i love it, this this had been this had been um this had been introduced or at least started in the Obama era, Trump rolled it back. And so Biden has brought it back, but has brought it back stronger. Oh, I love so, that. So uh, it's really, really good news um, for students, for transgender youth here in America. Obviously it's going to be an uphill battle, but that's it's amazing that we have um, constitutional stuff on our side for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I love this. I, you know, it, on one hand, I'm, I'm like, oh, I hate that it's come to this because this is really such a non-issue. Like all of these bigots have made like trans youth this big issue that like it never was. You know, there's there, all of these problems are just purely invented. Like where's where's the trans kid that's like winning all of these sports contests? I've never met them. You know, like it doesn't it, where's where's these these issues of like kids um, that are that are trans sneaking into the wrong bathroom like that's just not these things are invented issues the fact that we have to legislate it is sad but the fact that the the legislation is moving in that direction um in favor of our transgendered youth is is good like when you're a kid you should be free to play with things like your gender and sexuality and not have to worry about it like that's that's what the that's what that time is for is finding yourself finding your gender just like your harry potter house right (laughs) only a little bit more important (laughs) is it though does it have to be um i don't know i mean for us well (laughs) But no, basically, but what this does is it means that if there is a student who is assigned female at birth and wants to get dressed in the, in the male's locker room at fifth grade, she, they can, he can. Um, yeah. and it means that like respecting pronouns has to be taken into consideration. Uh, like these are all, it is unfortunately, you're right, invented problems, but it does protect, it does protect, it does make it so that we actively have to think of students of these of these uh identities of these identities have to think of transgender students so mm-hmm, the same way mm-hmm. that we have to think of disabled students right mm-hmm. that before title nine protects protected dis- disabilities there didn't have to be wheelchair ramps there didn't have to be elevators in school and now yeah. there have to be so now there has to be gender neutral bathroom like not necessarily like, schools get to determine how that is but this is building to a place that there might have to be gender neutral bathrooms available to students i mean um, there really should be the whole like the which, it's really silly that there's not 
yeah, which I am so, so incredibly thankful that my school is uh, where I'm at, that we went completely gender neutral with all our bathrooms because of COVID and our principal isn't changing it back, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, like why? If you found a way to make it work, just keep the gender neutral bathrooms and then you don't even have to worry about it. And they're inter and they're inner they're like individual bathrooms anyway. <laughs> like it's not yeah. like so it is it is perfectly aligned with with that and um no. So this is this is a big win. This is big news uh in the transgender community and the queer community. It's awesome that it happened during June. It's amazing that uh like that we're able to talk about it, especially because JK Rowling has such ties to to being a turf that we get to sit there and be like, well, fuck you, JKR. Uh, we're taking yeah. care of our trans youth one step at a time. God, I hope she doesn't comment on this. I really don't know what, want to know what she thinks about this. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt she will because it's American politics. She st usually sticks to uh, European politics. Yep, true. Okay, well, this was wonderful. I loved this. Thank you so much for sharing it, even though it wasn't on our normal website that we go to. Well, this was, was still like, very good news and fitting for the topic. I hope people are okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? You know what, Landon? It's pride. And during pride, the the gays can do whatever they want to do. So that Actually, means, yeah, it's, yeah, so that yeah. means like everybody will just have to deal with it being a little bit more serious this time if they didn't like it. So, Perfect. you know, that's that's the rules of, of June. <laughs> yeah, if you hear it, you, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. If you're queer, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Laws don't matter. It's homophobic. That's right. <laughs> It's That's right. Be gay, do crimes held up in June. <laughs> as soon as we're in July, they'll go back to hating us. But in June, we're allowed to do whatever we well, want. You'll know because all of a sudden, all the brands on Twitter will go back to their regular logo instead of their rainbow one, and then and then you know. You know, that's how that works. Ah, oh, right. You're donating money for me not to ever get married. Forgot about that for one month. Now we're back to it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to pet this kitty cat. Oreo is very politely asking for pets, so I have to I have to pet this kitty cat for a second. So cute. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, that's been our that's been our episode. Um, Landon, where can everybody find you? What What would you like to plug today? You can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine. There's mm -hmm. a new tattoo on there, so if it's you really cool. That very pretty um if you and you can also find me on tiktok at landon reverie i do tarot po pulling so if you want your tarot cards read hit me up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we need to make a command for your socials remind me to do that at some point this week before our next stream so that we can do just do like an exclamation landon socials or something but now we can do is it that or is it the other no way? it's it's exclamation landon you almost got it <laughs> there you go <laughs> all right <laughs> all right, where where can you find me? Well, first off, here's all my socials. I do things the same way every other content creator does them. You guys know how this works, right? Um, my shows, I have three shows. Two of them are here on Twitch. We do Interstage Window on Saturdays, which is me and almost always Landon is here too. It's our conversation show. We have community days sometime. Um, next week, we're going to be doing a role play topic. We're going to be talking about role play group applications. So we're going to be talking about different types of applications you might want to use and also what our tips are on um, accepting and denying and going through applications and all of that, that kind of process, right? Um, I also stream on Thursdays. That one's at 630. All these times are Eastern, by the way. Um, and we're playing some more Final Fantasy X. We are in the end game of that game. We're doing side quests right now. So if you'd like to see some um, something kind of like after the main plot, we haven't quite finished the main plot, but we've done most of it, right? So that's where we are in that game, and that's what we're going to be playing more of on Thursday. Also, every other Wednesday, I have episodes of Spare Room that go up on my YouTube channel. That's my role play help show. That's scripted. So if you like more scripted, more put together content, that's that show. All right. Um, last last announcement is July oh, yeah. 5th. Do I have the right date? I don't. July 3rd. July 3rd, we are doing Shadow and Bone, the TV show. Yes. Uh, for our media episode. So make sure to, uh, if you want to like have the ins and outs and opinions during the media episode, make sure to binge watch that entire show. Uh, we'll be here to dissect what we thought of it and the resonate if it resonates with us or not. Yeah, it's very it's very good. Um, I've watched it before. I'm doing my rewatch now to put like my more my more um, intelligent thoughts together. Um, my unintelligent first watch thoughts were 
I really liked it. Um, so if you want to hear more, uh, you know, than just that, show up to to that episode and uh, and watch it with us beforehand. That's what we're both doing right now. All right. Anything else before I find someone to raid? I think that's it. Okay. All right, guys. So we, I, y'all saw. If y'all have looked at the channel point redeems, you'll notice that guide the raid is off. That is because I already know who we were gonna raid when we started today. We're gonna raid my friend Jedlim because he is doing a fundraiser right now for Field Coast Cats, and um, it's a it's a kitty cat charity in the UK. And y'all know I love kitty cats. We've got Oreo right here. We've got um Lady Vox right here just off screen. Um, and I also have my kitty cat queen and, uh, and my roommate's cat Ash. So we love kitty cats in this house. And so any kitty cat charity, I'm going to be very, um, interested in. So that's who we're going to raid today. So I'm just going to pop that in. Perfect. Um, he has a sponsorship for this, by the way, with this Vikings game called Vikings War of Clans. If you download it and play the demo, the demo only takes you like two minutes. It's like a little tutorial for the game, literally two minutes. And, um, and that helps, uh, raise money for for the charity so you can do that on mobile or on your pc so i would um highly recommend you do that because it does not take long i did it this morning literally finished the whole thing in like two minutes all right here we go let's go raid jed all right here we go boom bye guys have fun don't forget to be awesome and Woo! don't forget to make it a great day <laughs>